In this episode of Another Zelda Podcast, David has the podcast Lore Party join him so that they can build a top 10 antagonist list. Welcome to another Zelda podcast. I am your host, David Geisler, here today with two very special guests. I am with Lawrence and Neil from the Lore Party podcast. Lawrence and Neil, how are you? Lawrence, why don't you go first? Uh, doing pretty good. Um, yeah. <laughs> All right. Very good. Very good. Neil, you're, you're well as well, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah. As good as anyone can be right now. Yeah. Indeed. Indeed. So if I may, uh, this is our first ever for another Zelda podcast. This is our first ever I guess you could say, quote unquote, Skype episode, that we are using Zoom tonight. We're using Zoom to chat with each other. And I understand that, Neil, you're Zooming in from New York. And Lawrence, are you in Ohio? Yes. Did I get that right? Yes. Yeah. So we're all over the place. So, Neil, if I may, me, you know, I live in Chicago. I'm Zooming from Chicago right now. Mm-hmm. It's pretty intense over here. It's pretty intense, but I, it's, I think it's just a pale comparison to the situation over in New York right now. Well, How are you faring? It's it's weird, isn't it? Like everyone, hopefully, if they can be, are being home and being responsible in doing yep. so. So I'm still lucky enough to be employed. You know, I'm just leaving to go on a walk, do laundry, get groceries. And it's so strange because everything is very different, yet the same. Uh I'm sure for you guys, days are blurring together. Uh, they have no meaning anymore. Yeah. Um, but, I, uh, I actually work a job. I work a job. I don't even know if our listeners know this. I work a job where I still have to go in every day. Oh, really? So I go in and I see thousands of people a day right now. It's it's It can be a little intense, but. <laughs> well, thank you for your service as an essential employee. <laughs> yes. I mean yeah. Fair enough. Fair enough. It's been, we've kind of gotten it under. It's mm-hmm. been a, it's been a journey. It's been many months. But then um, so then, Lawrence, for you out in Ohio, how is it? You said you just kind of recently moved there. Did you move during all of this craziness? Well, I moved. Uh, I've, I've lived in Ohio for like a majority of my life. But I just recently I live in Columbus down in the city. Yep. Um, so I recently moved there like end of last year. But I did start a new job basically at the start of all of this. So um I mean, I, you know, I work from home, so I haven't, I feel like I haven't left my apartment in like, uh, it's been weeks. It has been a, a long time. Um, yes, yes. But, you yeah, know, I mean, I'm, I'm doing good. Um, I am, I live with my, me and my fiance live together. So at least there's someone still here. So I'm not like going stir crazy, but <laughs> it's, uh, yeah, it's been getting boring. I've been trying to be productive. Well, that's, you know, I, a lot of the, another Zelda podcast, we like to have our episodes be what's called evergreen. We like them to be something that's not particularly timely. Some, you know, we find that a lot of our listeners go back to season one and season two, and they kind of dig into our episodes, which we love. makes us very, very happy. Um, This particular episode though, I don't mind at least mentioning the timeliness of it a little bit because part of the reason why Lore Party and another Zelda podcast reached out to each other was because of these, these interesting times we are in right now. And, um, immediately was, you know, I had a couple, I don't mind telling the audience as they kind of know this already. We had a couple, um, episodes scheduled that had to be canceled because of, of distancing and things like that, that when, uh, AZP and Lord Party started chatting. I basically begged you guys. I was like, please, 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 come on. Let's talk about, <laughs> let's do a chat. I can't wait. You guys are talking about Zelda. We talk about Zelda. I mean, you guys talk about a lot more. So maybe what I, I'd like to invite one of you to do. Well, I think, Lawrence, you're one of the executive producers of Lord Party. Isn't that right? Yeah. Yeah. I um, work as like a senior producer under Abu, who's the there it is, executive there it is. of the whole thing. Fair enough. Fair enough. Um, for my listeners, um, I've only had one other. Um, podcast on as a guest before that was the studio demands it back in season two um could you give a little pitch to what lore party is i've listened to a few episodes now admittedly i didn't wasn't familiar with the show until we started speaking and i'm i'm having a great time listening to it i really enjoy it could you tell our listeners a little bit about it yeah definitely um so lore party is a podcast that focuses on the in-game universe and storytelling um of of like specific characters in a video game. So just like, we'll, we'll look at different themes 
within a universe or like um, just kind of like different uh, topics that we can pull out of like a character or a story or arc or a line or piece of DLC. And then we will sit down and discuss it. So um, I have been Neil and I have both actually we've been on Lore Party since the very beginning. And so like just to kind of give you an idea of like some of the content that we've covered before. Um, when it came, when it comes to Zelda specifically, I think one of the last episodes that we did, it was me, um, Nick and Allie who are like kind of like infrequent contributors to lore party, but we did an episode on, um, where the timelines converged in Zelda with the breath of the wild being introduced. Um, so we, we had a, a fun time talking about that and then we'll go over things like, um, uh, I did a Last of Us series, and we discussed like Joel's bloody resume. So, uh, like the amount of people he's killed, and kind of like just his whole evolution from being a caring father to kind of just becoming sort of this like murderous, like <laughs> kind of crazy person by the end of the day, sure, or, or by sure. the end of the game. So, like. We, you know, we cover a, a wide breadth of content and then on Lore Party, we also have a couple of spinoff podcasts. So we have Winds Howling, which is a companion podcast to the Witcher Netflix series. And then we have Minigame, which are these kind of uh, like bite size, like di- easily digestible episodes that are that really take a deep dive into some themes of uh Michael normally covers like indie games, but he does do some AAA. So you'll get like um, one of his most recent episodes focused on the game One Night Stand. And it talked about how you can learn something about someone based off of like the items that they keep in their room or in their house. And so, yeah, I think um, it might be a few episodes back now for mini game, but I enjoyed it very much. There was like an eight or nine minute episode about Death Stranding, which was just kind of a, a monologue piece. I, I thought it was wonderful. Yeah, the stuff that Michael does, Michael is also another senior producer on the show. The stuff that he does with content, it's like it's crazy. I, he does I an like excellent job drawing you in. Yeah, like I, I every time I record an episode, like that's try, like that's my gold standard. That's what I like try to live up to on Lore Party. Like I, I that dude does everything from like the correct music choices to like the writing he does and how he just like just can narrate all this stuff. It's crazy. Indeed, it was it was very pleasurable. I'm also excited about our new relationship with Lore Party because when we when um, when Kate and I first started another Zelda podcast, this is almost two three years ago now. Um, I, w- I came in t- I, I came in as the one that wanted to talk about the behind the scenes of the games and the making of the games mm-hmm. and the mechanics of the games and how many polygons are in the games and blah, 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 and the systems. And Kate really wanted to talk about all the stories and the lore and all the different narratives that were happening. And I th- it was a really great relationship in the beginning that way, but I, I couldn't help it. Halfway through season one, I was like, yeah, but then maybe the Gorons did this and then maybe they <laughs> talked to those. And I got, I was totally in. I was in all the way. And I'm like... I was a, uh, Zelda was one of my favorite video games ever, um, enough for us to make this podcast about the game, but I had always looked at it from a, maybe more of a programming point of view, and I'm really grateful that this podcast has allowed me to get much more excited about all the different stories that are happening. And so, um, Neil, I wanted to ask you, do you, what's your um, most potent memory of Zelda? What's your experience with, with the Legend of Zelda franchise? Oh, man. I think... Um playing the Oracle games on Game Boy <gasps> Color as a kid. Like, I, anytime I think Zelda, like, instantly, like, I'm in that little square screen with like, my purple Game Boy Color in hand. And those games, to me, are so rich in lore. Just, like, it's your first time outside Hyrule, but things are very familiar yet different. You have all these races and uh, the same kind of, like, conflicts. Ganon's not there. Uh and everything about it just oozes with personality. Every single dungeon, per, like NPC you talk to, everything, like there's just such an inherent charm that I always go back to those games whenever I think about the series. Yeah, I absolutely love the Oracle games. I really do enjoy them. I think one of the things, my memory of the Oracle games was obviously we had played Ocarina and I think 
Oh, um, if memory serves, did the Oracle games come out between Ocarina and Majora, or were they after Majora? They, I think they were, like they were right after Majora. Yeah, they were. Okay. Uh, they were right before the Game Boy Advance released, I believe. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I remember walk. I remember walking around Chicago with my yellow Game Boy Color, yeah. playing Ages. You know, mm-hmm. and I bought it like day one or whatever. I remember going to a Best Buy and buying it day one, and I remember getting so excited that we were in this new space, but also like. I was talking to Zoras, and that had never happened on a Game yeah. Boy before. It was this, some of this ocarina ness was coming in, you know, as I was walking down the street, as, as I was riding the subway, mm-hmm. and I have very fond memories of the Oracle games. And, you know, I just realized we didn't even tell our audience what we're doing tonight. I got to say, we're, we're about, I don't know, five, ten minutes in here. I want to mention it. We are doing, oh, I guess they saw the episode of the title. <laughs> <laughs> So they have deduced that today the three of us are going to be building a top 10 antagonist list. But there's a little bit of a a tweak to that. I think maybe it was you, Lawrence, that pitched what if we did top 10 antagonists that aren't Ganon. Isn't that right? Yes. So what made you... um, We we were tossing around a couple ideas on what to do for this episode. I did kind of say I think a top 10 format would work well. But what brought that idea on for you? Um, I think... The Legend of Zelda has, in my opinion, some of the most like enjoyable boss battles of like of of any like I don't know, I've been playing these games for so long. To me, they just have like just such great boss battle mechanics. Um and choosing Ganon, I I I don't know. It, to me it's a cop out because I would I would probably have chosen Ganon just because of I loved the Ocarina of Time boss battle at the end where you're going back and forth and just like knocking the energy ball back and forth until you can hit him like i i really loved that boss battle but i feel like Mm -hmm. to give to kind of give ourselves a challenge we got to like drop off the the main baddie of the series and and kind of explore some of some of like the you know the more obscure and maybe little lesser known or less remembered boss battles I agree. I agree. And and for what it's worth, perhaps you guys aren't familiar yet, but our season one finale almost two years ago was a full just look at all the Ganon battles. Mm-hmm. So like we've totally covered that already. And so when you said top 10 antagonists that aren't Ganon or Ganondorf or whatever, I was very excited about that idea. I want to um, do I'm only going to do one listener feedback today because it's awesome. Um, usually I try to pepper in four or five in the beginning, but I wanted to get to know you guys first today. Uh, I'm going to share one of our reviews over on iTunes. And just as a quick reminder to all of our listeners, anytime you uh, leave a review on iTunes, it really helps us in the search and it helps us show up for more people in the recommended episodes. And perhaps one day, uh, another Zelda podcast and Lore Party will be sharing recommended, uh, if you like this, you also like this, things on iTunes one day, I certainly hope. Uh, let's see here. So I have a review from oh, my my screen has a little there we go <laughs> the, from a from a person called Stupefy Catadrava Kata, mm-hmm. two exclamation points <laughs> the title is favorite boss battles all right uh, here's here's our review five star review over on iTunes I love this one we just got this the other day hello I'm a nine year old kid and I love Zelda I love the episodes that are related to the races and the top 10 episodes I especially love the one about the boss battles I have a time limit for how much I play but I'm still enjoying the game a lot I have beat the original Zelda game and I'm in the middle of a link to the past and Ocarina of Time right now I'm playing Breath of the Wild and I love the boss battle against Fireblight Ganon also I need help because I don't know how to become a patron could you help me? <laughs> Love your podcast. I hope you keep doing this for a long time. Also, I have a question. I heard that in the creepy cutscene in Twilight Princess, Link kills Ilya? What? The rest of that cutscene is not so scary, but is that true? If it is, how does this Link kill Ilya? <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much, stu- Stuperfy Katrav. I don't know how to say your name, but thank you so much for the review. Um... Uh, we really appreciate that. There's a, there's a lot to unpack there. I think there there is a nightmare scene in Twilight Princess with Ilya. I don't recall Link specifically kill, killing Ilya. Do either of you are you either so of you familiar? I'm replaying through Twilight Princess currently. Um, yes, and I just finished the Lake Bed Temple uh, the other week. So that scene is the light spirit explaining to Link and Minna about the Twilight tribe, uh, specifically the dark interlopers. And it was using 
Link and Ilya as set pieces to represent uh, what was going on in the story. So Ilya, as someone who covets the Triforce, tries to stab Link, who is filling in as one of the dark interlopers, but he counters. I see, I see. So, of course, it's not it's not really those two, uh, but they right. are play acting in a sense to make the point. It is scary, though. Yeah, yeah. There's a couple there's a couple scenes that get a little freaky over there in, in Twilight Princess. Very, there's, I mean, there's there's a bit of Majora's Mask cutscene stuff that gets evoked in Twilight Princess, that's mm-hmm. for sure. And then just real quick here uh, to our person who left us this wonderful, wonderful review. Um, if you do want to find some of our uh, Patreon tiers, our, our different Patreon benefits, you can just go to our website, anotherzeldapodcast.com. And we have in our top menu, there's the word Patreon. And if you click on that, it'll take you a link right to our Patreon page. And you can find a lot of different ways to support the show and find different pieces of content. So I hope you do that if you are so inclined. Otherwise, just keep on listening. That's all we need. And so I'm so excited to hear that this uh, this person is playing so many games right now. I also appreciate the time limit. They're being responsible. It's it's it's. I mean, this. I'm sure that that's imposed by some kind of parent figure. But nevertheless, <laughs> it sounds like this reviewer is being very responsible with that. And I thought that was a really nice one to read. All right, gentlemen. Let's do this. Let's build our top 10 list. So to, what we're going to do, each of us have picked, I think, at least three. But I think, Neil, I overheard something about you grabbed like eight or nine or yeah, ten. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm kind of flying by the seat of my pants on this one. I, re- I mean, look how many games there are. Look how many bosses there are. Top 10 list could never do it justice. So whichever one on my personal list strikes me in the moment, that's who I'm picking. Okay, I'm for it. I'm for it. I don't mind that at all. Lawrence, how, how are you set up over there? Um, I've... <sighs> kind of narrowed it down to three but i'm also i i feel like i might change it as this conversation goes that's perfectly fine i do have three i generally what we do here even though it's going to be pretty loose tonight generally we try to do uh i guess you could say least to most so if we're doing a favorites we start with a number five if it was just kate and i we'd be doing five each when we do these lists um, you know, if it was top 10 ba- boss battles, we did an actual just boss battles episode and, and maybe my first entry, number five would be one that I thought was cool, but they just got cooler and cooler and cooler until we get to the final. So that's, I think that's the order of ascension or descension that we'll use tonight. Sound good? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Now let's see here who let's, how about this? Neil, I think I might invite you to go first okay. and then I'll go and then we'll give Lawrence uh, the, the final word. Cause I think he'll have the final, um, uh, contribution then at the end of the episode. Sound good? All right. Sounds great. Yeah. So what could be, now this is not an exact top 10 list. We always talk about this. We're, this is just a mm-hmm. fan podcast, not an expert podcast. And every time we build one of these top 10 lists, we're sure that a couple years later, we could probably do top 10 again with another 10. And, and one of my favorite things. For reevaluation. There's yeah. always room. And one of my favorite things is that a lot of times when we do one of these episodes, our listeners will tweet in with things that we didn't talk about, which just continues the conversation, which is really nice. Mm-hmm. So, Neil, what might be your bottom of your top three? All right. So the bottom of my top three is still pretty cool. <laughs> still pretty cool. I don't think anyone's going to agree with me on this. <gasps> Smog from the Oracle of Ages in the Crown Dungeon. I don't know if you remember this guy. He's a little cloud monster with two horns, pair of eyeballs. That's it. And he runs around some blocks, splitting himself into smaller and smaller oh forms. Gosh. And you need to use the Cane of Samaria to generate a block and figure out how to combine these creatures back into the original boss so you can fight him. And this is a boss fight as a child in adulthood. No matter what, it's a challenge every time because it's one of the few bosses I find where, oh, you actually brought my favorite part of Zelda, which is puzzles into a boss fight. Uh, I think it's excellent. It's just SMAUG, right? I'm just building a little list here. uh, I think it's just SMOG, just smog. Yep, yep, no problem. I, I do recall this battle. Now, honestly, Oracle of Ages, mm-hmm. as I was saying at the top of this episode, I, it was almost 15 years ago or maybe more when I was walking around playing it. I've dipped in a few times since. Mm-hmm. I'm looking forward to playing it again, but I'm actually, I've just been tr- starting to wrap up seasons. So I, I actually forgot about this battle until you mentioned it. And you're right. By building that block, you're trying to basically create the opposite of a fork in the road, a pinch point to exactly. make the, the, everything come back together. 
And like I, just, I really can't think of another boss in the series that I had to actively think not about how do I avoid his attacks, not how do I get to hit him, but just where do I need how do I'm actively solving a block puzzle, one of the core mechanics of this series. Yes, I think it's brilliant. I love it. I love it. A lot of canes. That's when we start getting canes too. After that, mm-hmm. Cap, the, Cap, the Capcom Nintendo collaborations, they like they had to have a cane in every single game. I feel. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> so, okay, I think maybe I'll, we'll move on. That's great. We got we got smog mm-hmm. there. Or actually, if I may, Lawrence, do you have anything to say about that that particular boss? Um, no, that was I actually forgot about that one. But no, that was an enjoyable boss battle. It's been so long since I played um, Oracle of Ages because I originally had seasons and I didn't play Ages until like I was a lot older. I, that one completely slipped my mind, but that was actually it was frustrating at first and then like kind of enjoyable. Mm-hmm. It's like I actually had to stop and think like, OK, what do I have to do to to beat this? Instead of just like mindlessly button mashing. Right. Absolutely. I'm trying I'm starting to think I might reorder my three here real quick. And so obviously three times three times three or, you know, three times three is not, is nine or whatever. So we're, we're going to we're not going to hit 10 with the with the three of us. But I do have some listener tweets with a list. So I think if there's any that the listeners tweeted that we don't mention, we'll all decide at the end of the episode what our 10th item on the list just might be. Sound good, guys? Yeah, sounds great. So, OK, I think I had a mildly different interpretation of antagonist and I used kind of like main antagonists to oh, each gotcha. different story. When, you know who takes the place of a Ganon or a Ganondorf, okay. um, and so I think I think my first one is going to be one because it's it's cool, but it's a bit of a cheat as a main antagonist, and I think it actually is a good transition because this character is also often just maybe like a boss battle, or or even in some cases a mini boss battle. And uh, when I was building my list, I was trying to think of I was kind of going through all the games, and I was thinking, well, okay, a lot you know a lot of times there's a a switcheroo halfway through the game where, haha, it actually was Ganon, you know, doing mm-hmm. something. And uh, I think some of those characters might still show up on our lists tonight, and I'm perfectly fine with that. But um, the first time that uh, Ganon was not the main antagonist was Zelda 2, was the adventure of Link. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And that whole game obviously exists as this kind of epilogue almost. I mean, it's its own huge game and everything, but it's almost an epilogue because Ganon's. If you if you die in that game, it's not that Ganon wins; it's that G- the, then the bad guys are able to bring Ganon back. So yeah, Ganon's through your not blood there. from dying. Yeah. Yes, indeed, <laughs> indeed. So like, who's who's the who's the boss? Who's the bad guy in a game like that? You're just trying to not die so that Ganon doesn't come back. Of course, there's other adventures to be had, mm-hmm. but um, you know, the final. I think most people know that the final boss in that game is the first time that we get Dark Link, and so mm-hmm. I wanted to put him on the list here because in some ways he's a main antagonist and the only thing that the reason I want this to be at the bottom of my list is because I think there are cooler more interesting versions of Dark Link in boss battles in later games Mm -hmm. but I at least wanted to throw it out there that um, Zelda 2 had Dark Link as the final boss battle and actually I do want to note that maybe you guys recall that Dark Link isn't summoned by some kind of like demon. He's not there all the time. It's actually the old man who's been helping the whole time summons him. I don't know. Maybe it's a final test or something like that. But this he's is there immediately after the Thunderbird fight, right? Indeed, indeed. Right okay. after Thunderbird, then it's like, and you're fighting yourself now. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and you do, you do fight yourself. And I think it's a touch. I don't want to say it's a cop up, but it's a. T- this is why I have it at the bottom is because obviously it's just a black palette sprite it's not a new sprite or anything there there's uh dark link doesn't bring any extra and fancy new moves that you have to figure out how to you just have a sword fight with yourself at the end Mm -hmm. but i at least want to throw that out there and um maybe i could expand this a little bit do uh lawrence do you have a personal favorite uh dark link experience yes it's funny i i will uh probably end up changing my list because that was my second one but (laughs) but i really like um you know, Ocarina of Time, Water Temple, Dark Link boss battle. That was one of my favorites. Because um, because the uh, um, Ocarina of Time, that was the first Zelda game that I was able to beat without, like, looking at online facts. Right, right, right. Like, that was, so, like, I just think as a kid playing a video game, that was, like, the ultimate triumph. And when I got to that boss, I was so blown away. Because, you know, that's before you could look up 
like you could, you know, go up and look up the plot on on like any website. I was just like, OK, I'm in this boss battle in this water temple trying to get through. And then you're fighting yourself. And I really like that you had to be strategic on how you fought Darkling, because if you just like swung your sword at him, he would jump on your sword and then you would get like kind of stunned in place for a second. There's no corner of the screen for you to crouch in this time. Right, right. Like, I was like, normally you're nice. just good to get a couple hits in on a boss and, mm-hmm. like, you know, kind of flub your way through it. But, like, he, when he jumped on the sword and I was stunned and I was, like, trying to move at one point, I was like, it's crazy. No other yeah. boss does that. And the delivery of that boss battle, it's technically a mini boss, so you're not expecting it. You just go into this room that, for some reason, all of a sudden doesn't have walls. And they kind of do a a Metroid trick there where, you know, the boss doesn't show up until the character turns back around. So you're Mm -hmm. walking into this room and you're you're like, something's going to happen. This is, I don't know if it's good or bad. It feels ethereal, but the tree's dead in the middle, so you're not sure if it's positive or negative. Mm -hmm. You get to the other door, you don't know what's going on. You turn back around. Oh, and I think actually there's a technicality. Maybe you guys are familiar with this. Doesn't if you pass the tree, doesn't Link's literal feet shadows actually disappear or something? I believe so. Yeah. Or and you turn around and there he is. He's 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 hovering by the tree and attacks. Oh, that was a very moving moment for me back in the day. I just remember as a kid finding out you could use the megaton hammer, and then it's like, oh, this is oh yeah, <laughs> this yeah. makes sense. <laughs> the best way to defeat myself. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Finding that out after the fact and seeing people just kind of like spam the hammer and beat the boss so quickly. Mm-hmm. I It took me so long to beat Dark Link as a kid. I think I sat there for two hours and tried to beat that boss. Yeah. You know, that's interesting. I don't want to get on too much of a tangent, but, you know, Miyamoto was talking about how when he was they were designing the Z targeting system for Ocarina, that a lot of the combat was inspired by Zelda 2 with 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 the parrying and, the th- you know, uh, holding the shield and sword fighting and shield and all that kind of stuff and the jump attacks and all of that. Um, that's a that's a kind of a poetic uh, cross there where it's Dark Link and Zelda 2. And the next time we see him is in Ocarina in a similar experience. And I think that that battle with Dark Link, if you're not spamming the hammer does have to be strategic. You can't just kind of wail away. He just blocks, 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 you know? Yeah. You got to be on the move. You got to be thinking. Maybe bust out one Din's fire if you've got the magic for it, but that's it. (laughs) I'd always, I'd use that first. (laughs) (laughs) I'd go in there with Din's fire. Oh, man, alive. Uh, Neil, real quick, if I may, real quick, how about you? Do you have a Dark Link uh, experience or memory that that also sticks out for you? There's an Oracle one. I've never been into dark link as a recurring antagonist in Zelda, sure. just cause like, I don't, I didn't have like an N64 growing up. So I don't, I didn't have a fondness really for, uh, anything going on in that game. Uh, Zelda two is impossible and will always be <laughs> impossible for me. So I just, I can't do it. Um, yeah. but other than that, I think the only real instance is in, uh, four sword adventures on the GameCube, right? Yeah. Yeah. There's a dark link situation there. Yeah. Right, where it's uh, to me that just seemed like uh, like in Mario Sunshine, like oh, here's the shadowy version of yourself chasing you around. Look at like from like a story, like an actual story standpoint, uh, there just wasn't ever enough substance to do anything for me. Uh, yeah, fair enough. Yeah, fair enough. Well, let's uh, let's use let's keep on keeping on here. And Lawrence, what do you think your first entry into the list might be? Okay, so my first entry was just basically. I based it off of just pure enjoyment of the fight. So mine is from Majora's Mask, and it's the uh, masked mechanical monster goat. Oh, I'll have to cross that off my list. From Snowhead. That was uh, Snowhead. The whole Snowhead arc of that game was amazing. But Mm -hmm. I really loved that boss just because you had to beat him using just the like kind of uh goron role yeah you're in the race yeah like yes indeed you're on a track (laughs) it's great you're just going around and around and around and the Mm -hmm. first time i beat the boss it was like it was before i knew that you could slow down time in the game so i beat the boss as (gasps) like the third day was ending Yes. Oh, oh, the tension. A literal race against the clock. Yeah. Against so, the boss. Like, oh, man. It was just like, it was insane. I'm like, oh my <laughs> God, I got to beat this guy. It's like, this is crazy. This is crazy. And then so I didn't get 
to like experience the springtime and get like the gold dust for the gilded blade until like I went back and played the game again. But oh, of like, course, it um, it was it was exciting. It was it was a lot different because you know I'm used to like every Zelda game is you either are a sword or you know some item. This one you're rolling around or you're throwing like a fiery punch. Mm-hmm. So. Yeah, I remember the first time I got into that experience, I was, you know, you start, he takes off and you think you're going to do, my interpretation at the time, I was like, oh, maybe this is like a Dodongo thing from Ocarina where I'm going to run the other way and meet him around the other way or something. But it's just, it's just impossible because this is just this massive donut. And then you start rolling and you're like, oh, this is what we're doing. Oh, we're doing this. This is, I got to hit the jumps. Oh, I'm like the mechanics change during that fight. That is mm-hmm. a good one. Yeah, well, so. I love to like, it starts off, you have to use a fire arrow to thaw him out. And then he goes on his rampage. And then what my favorite attack that he does, he basically launches a lightning bolt forward and you're on the circular track and it comes around to get you from behind Mm -hmm. and i had never really seen a move like that in zelda before uh yeah because every boss is just like oh here's an energy ball at you oh look out i'm gonna stab you no this dude's thinking on a whole different level yeah, and then of course, famously there in uh, in the Majora's Mask remake, they they did still have to throw that big, huge eyeball on his back to make it a little bit more of a cl- a classic, quote unquote, Zelda boss. Of course, <laughs> I still haven't played that remake, but I think I'm going to pick it up while I have a little more time on my hands. I did finally pick it up. Mm-hmm. I've kind of famously not had a Switch or a 3DS for like the first two seasons of this show, but I finally have both now, mm-hmm. and um, I because we're we're going to be doing a Majora's Mask review this season. And I couldn't decide, like, should we review the remake or should we review the old one, remake or old one? And there's a lot of good things about the remake. But I think ultimately, at least for the purpose of the show, maybe this would inform your choice, Neil. Mm -hmm. um, I think we're going to go classic because we got to review it the way it was. There's enough changes. I get that. Yeah, it's my understanding. A lot of like the bosses have like had a little too many tweaks to them. Uh, Yeah. The 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 mechanics overall had some weird stuff going on. Zora's different. The savings a little different, and I do, I personally don't think any of those changes are are bad. Mm-hmm. But I think if you're like, we did our Ocarina review last season, and if we're going into Majora's, I think we got to stay original cartridge. And so Absolutely. I would not I would not dissuade you from trying it out. But if you're if you don't have that original experience, I still think that one might be like the the right one. You right know on. what I mean? Mm-hmm. All right, let's see here. Well, honestly, I think we've got a little bit of time for this first half still. Um, what, Neil, why don't we keep on moving here with your, I guess it would be your second. Yes. Um, so for my second, uh, now Smog was a very personal antagonist to me. So as far as a real antagonist goes, I think Girahim from Skyward Sword is an excellent fight and an excellent antagonist. Uh, a lot of people don't like that game and that's fine and that's <laughs> fair. I had a blast with it when it came out. Yep, it's the only Zelda I haven't replayed. Don't know if I will, but <laughs> man, to just have this creepy, slick-looking silver guy <laughs> going mano y mano with you with swords, he's throwing these little—I uh, don't even know—like darts, like yeah. needles. I it don't feels know. like yeah, it feels like he's got fancy little needle darts. You're right. Yeah, like he like t- for the first fight in that game where you have to think about how you're swinging your sword, what you can do actively looking for openings in an enemy who's teleporting behind you, fighting from afar, fighting close combat. There's so much variety in how he fights, how you have to think and what you can do. And then to see him like come up and evolve himself over the game in ways that don't really feel too cheap or anything. uh, And being a central part of the story I, th- I think he's he's wonderful, uh, yeah. especially because if I'm not mistaken, he's the boss of the first dungeon. It's not like he has some classic forest temple goon you can fight. It's one of the big bad guys. Right. And yeah, I don't think right, a Zelda right. game has really done that. No, but the only one that comes to mind and it's not exactly the same is like the Phantom Ganon in Ocarina. But it's not this. That's not that's a different corporal being. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, uh, Lawrence, do you have any thoughts on Gearheen? Um, I am. Uh, see, I, for what it's worth, I like the Skyward Sword. Like it was okay. It it, it wasn't my favorite Zelda game. Uh, Allie, well, who normally hops on some of our Zelda episodes, yeah, uh, it is. 
one of her favorite games and she also doesn't understand why people like wind waker so that's always our like back and forth <laughs> okay. like stab at each other um i don't know i i thought i mean i i do like i, I like that point of like you know there's not like he doesn't have that lackey that you sent like you're fighting him right away so i think i mm-hmm. do think that's cool he's also just kind of weird Oh, yeah, he's a total he's, creep, which, yeah, like, <laughs> those were the elements I kind of liked about Zance, but I thought he was, like, just too campy. This guy was so campy that it came back around to be fun for me. He was almost a, he was almost self-aware, wasn't he? Yeah, he, knew, exactly. he knew what he was doing almost, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. Yeah. Fair enough. Well, honestly, I think I don't want our um, Zoom recording to, to time out here or anything like that. Um, I think we should probably cut to break, and we'll come back, and we'll pick up. With, I'll go with my second... Uh, on the list, and we'll just keep on going. Does that sound good, gentlemen? Yeah. Okay, cool. All right, cool. I'll see you in about a minute or so. Okay. All right. See ya. Hey there. My name's Abuzafar, and I'm the creator of the Lore Party Podcast. It's a show about our favorite video game universes and the stories they tell. What does that mean exactly? Well, we don't do game reviews or first impressions, and we don't talk about gameplay or the latest news in the gaming industry. Our main focus is with the lore, the stories, the characters, and the worlds that we jump into every time that we fire up our favorite games. If that sounds like your cup of tea, just search Lore Party on your favorite podcast platform and check out some of our episodes. Thanks for listening. Hey everybody, David here. I hope you're enjoying the episode so far. I just wanted to talk to you about some of the updates we have on our Patreon page. Now, as some of you know, we do have our three tiers, the sword tier, the white sword tier, and the magical sword tier. And we've been getting some really tremendous support over on Patreon. It's it's tr- truly amazing. And I wanna tell you a little bit about some of our new rewards. So for starters, we've decided to add the wallpaper reward to our sword tier. This means that anyone who is a supporter on Patreon will get a special thank you on our website and they'll also receive the ability to download wallpapers once a month from our Patreon page. Now I make these wallpapers myself and it's a lot of fun. They come in a variation of screen sizes. I also make a phone version and an iPad version. I even make an Apple Watch version which is kind of fun. Next we have our white sword tier and that's staying pretty much the same. What the white sword level will give you is early access to each of our episodes. Typically it's about a week before. Um, Also advertisement free versions of those episodes and I record a a little patreon specific intro before each one just a touch of behind the scenes before we get into the episodes also of course on the white sword tier we have our bonus content which we release just little mini episodes every oh i don't know every three or four normal episodes we put a little mini episode in there that will also be available on the private rss link that you'll receive by becoming a white sword member And lastly, this is the big one. Our Magical Sword tier, Kate and I have decided to bring a camera with us into the studio, you could say, every single episode going forward after episode 17 of season two. So we just kind of set this camera up and we say a little quick intro to our Magical Sword patrons and we let them be there with us, so to speak, while we record the episode. I'm really excited about this because I've been wanting to give our Magical Sword supporters something really special, and I think this is a great way to do it. Okay, so that's it. You can go to patreon.com slash another Zelda podcast. You can also find links on our website to our Patreon page. We're so grateful for the support we've received already, and um, if you are interested in any of these rewards at all, please go check us out. And we are back uh lawrence as, while we were on break i said i was this i haven't used zoom too much to be honest i i'll admit and i was like okay cool what do we do stop the file start recording again and you mentioned that you have a license and we're and we're on that right now so thank you so much for that oh. i didn't realize that was happening no problem we just get to record and record and record <laughs> yeah i had to uh just like side note i had a virtual graduation thing that i had to attend so i picked up a license so we could just like host it continuously without it booting everybody in my family out. So nice, indeed. Yeah, I get it. I get it. And we're also being able to take advantage of it tonight. And I'm very grateful. Thank you so much. Which actually, if I may, may I speak a little bit about how I'll be actually joining? It, will it be the both of you on a lore party episode, Neil and Lawrence, mm-hmm. or is it? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Excellent. We're going to be recording that in just a couple of days, and I can't wait to be a guest on your show. I think it's going to be a lot of fun. Oh yeah. I'm excited. It'll be exciting. 
I was I was thinking we're going to be speaking about um, we're going to be speaking about the Oracle games and the kingdoms and one's kind of a kingdom one's kind of just disparate land well that's the but thing the, right? the societies that yeah. that exist in the oracle games i think is what we're gonna we're gonna be digging into the mm-hmm. lore of that and neil you've put together quite a few notes already i think that i've seen which is really yeah exciting. well because that's always just always something i think i look forward to in a zelda game like oh my god we're not in hyrule you know like <laughs> terminal uh the, the settings of the oracle games uh yep. new hyrule Jeez, oh man it's the best. So I haven't gotten to new. Oh yeah, new Hyrule. Yeah, yeah, new Hyrule. I was thinking about Hyrule and Low Rule. I'm still. I have not played. I own it, but I have not played um, a Link Between Worlds yet because I we was just impressed finished with that when it came out. I'm very excited to get into it. I'm very excited. I got to do the review games first, but I'm very excited to play it for sure. And actually, just real quick, since we're on the on the topic, um, if people want to find Lore Party, is it? I, I've subscribed on iTunes, but also, could you let people know what the website is right now, and, and maybe some of the other places where you post the show? Yeah. Do you want to do it, Neil? No. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> uh, okay. Um, so, yeah, we're, uh, you know, you can find us loreparty.com. Um, and then we're pretty much on every single place. We're everywhere you can listen to podcasts. So, fair enough. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Cool. That'll do it. That'll do it. All right. Let's go back into our top 10. So, so far. We've had Smog, Darklink, Goat. What were the others, gentlemen? I, I started not writing them all down. Uh, I had Gear of Him. Yep, yep, yep. And that's where that's where we left off. Oh, is that all, that's all we had? Okay, so I just missed mm-hmm. the one. That was because of the break. So I'm going to go with Bellum as my number two. Ooh, fun. Yeah, I, I remember enjoying Bellum a lot, but I was a little torn about this choice, I'll be honest. Mm-hmm. Um, I had a difficult relationship with phantom hourglass i playing it like there were portions of it i thought were really cool and really brilliant and really exciting i didn't mind the new controls at the time i thought it was actually a very smart way to reinterpret maybe how to play on a, on a system that had a touch screen mm-hmm. um the the bellum fight itself i think is 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 well executed where you're using both screens and it's vertical based and you're using a lot of a lot of the things that you've built up to it but while I was doing my research over the past couple of days for this episode, I noticed a very strange aesthetic about Bellum. And, and maybe that's why I'm actually putting Bellum on here. Maybe Bellum should have been my third, but anyways, it doesn't really matter. This is kind of an, a whatever list. Um, so Bellum's a big eye with a mouth around it, as, as many of us know. Bellum is one of the only main antagonists that never like really says anything, never talks. Bellum's almost more of a, like a force of nature. Mm-hmm. And I couldn't help but notice when I was was so I mean I've I've played Bellum, I've beat Bellum, but I did go up on YouTube and watch some of the battles again just so that I could refresh myself. And there are portions where Bellum spews out these other eyeballs. Mm-hmm. And the eyeballs hit the ground and they come up, and I'll be they look exactly like Malice in Breath of the Wild. They have the same purple stalks, there's yellow eyes looking around, and you have to fight them. I don't Hmm. think there's a connection i think a a retcon connection could be made for the fun of it but um i just i couldn't help myself i was like what is happening here bellum's kind of a force in nature maybe like malice a little bit i think there might be something to it uh which is kind of fun but otherwise um bellum's bellum i don't know do you guys have any thoughts i have not thought about phantom hourglass in a long time outside of it just kind of being nearly almost like a tech demo for the DS because that game really utilized every <laughs> faculty of that handheld. Um, that is the best what's, what's nine different ways you can blow at the screen? <laughs> <laughs> that is the best way I've ever heard that game described, a tech demo. Because <laughs> there's nothing amazing <laughs> you just about to, it. But, but yeah. the characters, like Lineback, oh my goodness. Lineback's fun. Love him. Like Because uh, that's part of the final, that's like the first phase of the fight, if I recall correctly. He, pos- like, Bellum possesses yes. Lineback, puts him in the phantom armor, and you're you right, gotta actually, fight him. You're absolutely right. I kind of skipped over all that. He, like, Bellum, like, zombifies these characters, grabs Zelda, grabs grabs Lineback. It's later on back in the in the phantom hourglass temple mm-hmm. where where he starts shooting out the eyeballs and stuff like that. You're right. Yeah, so he that comes is up kind of, of in water. line with how Ganon fights. You know, he it's like first phase is always some puppet of some sort. And in this case, it's Ooh. Lineback. Didn't you? Have yeah, to trace, I like that. Didn't you have to trace your path that your ship 
went on with mm-hmm. the, the stylus. Okay. To move around, yeah. Yeah, it's been it's been so long since I played that. You know, I had a friend, I had a close friend, actually Dan McCoy, who was just on our most recent episode, he asked me at work the other day, he said, Why is there a train in, you know, one of the Zeldas? Spirit tracks. Why is there a train? <laughs> he said, I don't really recall ever seeing a train in any of the others. And I said, Yeah, I, I remember thinking that was a little strange too. But I said, But if you look at that final timeline. There is a bit of an evolution of technology where Wind Waker, it's ships with wind. Then Phantom Hourglass, it's ships that are steam powered. Yeah. And then mm-hmm. we have steam engines in that third one when once we're over on New Hyrule. And yeah, because this is 100 years after the Wind Waker, right? You know, it's so funny. It's always 100 years, right? Yeah, it's like right, 100 yeah. years, 100 years, 100 Ocarina, years. Wind Waker. <laughs> I know. Tracks. At a certain point, we're like thousands and thousands of years on but like the technology hasn't increased that much but anyway <laughs> yeah you know you're absolutely right it is like 100 years later where i think the phantom hourglass link is still the wind waker link but then yes. it skips yeah yes. mm-hmm. anyways anyways i just want to throw bellum out there maybe i just want to talk about malice eyes uh maybe i just cannot wait for breath of the wild 2 and i just got it on the mind but which ironically is going to have ganondorf back of course <laughs> i'm okay with it in this case i'm okay with it too i'm really excited teaser about that. that teaser did a lot of work yes my goodness indeed cool all right so lawrence what might be your second then see this was gonna this is gonna be the top of my list but i've moved it down um twin rova yep is definitely no matter no matter where she appears in whatever game it's always i i'm i feel like i'm just going off of pure enjoyment but it's always an enjoyable boss battle and it's also like normally an interesting like part of the plot because like the the twin rova like sorcerers were in a few games and like i think weren't they they were in um majora's mask well, yeah, the two old ladies are in Majora's Mask. Yes. I don't yes. recall if they become Twin Rova. No, they they sell like potions. Yep. I think. Yeah, in the swamp. Yeah, mm-hmm. and, that, and like that's it. But yeah, like, they're pretty chill in that game actually. <laughs> but like previous game, you know, they're um, you know these sorcerers that you battle in the Spirit Temple, and then they combine together, and like you have to defeat them using the Mirror Shield, and you have to like redirect the attack to like the particular side that mm-hmm. it affects. Cause you're like stocking it up in the shield, right? Waiting for them to switch and then you unleash. Yes. And yeah. that was honestly the, of, um, of Ocarina of time. That was my favorite boss battle. I actually, when I originally played it, I purposely die or I purposely turned the game off and turned it back on so I could replay the boss battle because it was like <laughs> so much fun. Nice. You know, and and according to the lore, apparently uh, the two sisters who uh, Kotak, Kume and Ko, Kotake or something like that. I can't remember something the like second. That. Yeah, I think Kume is one for sure. Um, they it's allegedly they like raised Ganondorf, by the way. Yes. According to mm-hmm. some of the lore. Yeah. And I will I will confess, uh, Kate and I did a top ten boss battle episode uh, last year. And Twin Rova and Goat did show up on that list. They are good ones for sure. I oh, think absolutely. Twin Rova might have been Kate's top, if I may. Yeah, I was. I'm like, do I go with the obvious choice? If it's not, if I don't pick Ganon, Twin Rova is is definitely like it's it's always an enjoyable boss battle. And like like I said, just there's just there's the unexplored lore, and then there's just like some of the the uh, like times that it, times that they appear in Zelda games, and they just like add a lot to what's mm-hmm. already going on. I agree. I agree absolutely. Um, Neil, maybe you might have a little bit to say about Twin Rova in the Oracle games. I never, I don't think I ever got to Twin Rova because I didn't have seasons until I downloaded it as a, as a virtual console years mm-hmm. later. So in the Oracle games, uh, if you beat one, you get a password, you input it into the other game, and you can continue as that version of Link who just came from, let's say, ages into seasons. And Twin Rova shows up after, I believe, the sixth dungeon um, as just like an old man in disguise spewing some nonsense. And eventually you get to the end of the Linked game and Twin Rova shows up in this very weird room with two little brazers that light up after Varen and Onox, the antagonists of uh, their respective games, 
really bring down the hammer. And the la- the last brazen is lit when Twin Rova puts up Zelda, who was kidnapped. And this is all in effort to revive Ganon. Uh, now, the way that the timeline works is the link in the Oracle games is the same link from A Link to the Past and Link's Awakening. Mm-hmm. Uh, so he's been on a couple of journeys. He's already slayed Ganon. He's already saved Zelda. And now you got to prevent the big guy from coming back. You get to fight Twin Rova again in 8-bit this time. Mm-hmm. And I'll tell you, it's just as fun as yeah. Ocarina. It's <laughs> oh, a great man. fight. Yes. Uh, I just, I I was really hoping we were going to get some, uh, unless I missed it, some allusion to her in Breath of the Wild when we got to go to uh, the Gerudo village full of yeah. all females, of course. Right. But I didn't catch anything, at least. Yeah, I always, I felt like when I first played that game, I felt like it was going to be the, uh, like, in the boss battle somehow. Mm-hmm. And oh sure 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 you're talking about breath right now yeah yeah, yeah mm-hmm. I, I i had like i thought about that and i was like okay maybe they'll maybe they'll bring it back inside of uh and for, for the boss battle but i mean if they want to go full if they want to stick to the mold in a good way and have have the the sisters in breath of the wild too and there's a little bit of a connection to the ganondorf situation because the ganondorf in Breath of the Wild 2 is the Ganondorf from Twilight Princess, which is the Ganondorf from Ocarina. So it's conceivable. But I guess you I guess you do defeat them in Ocarina, though. They literally go to heaven, which I always thought was a little weird. Because oh, yeah. right. they're, they're witches. <laughs> they literally get halos or something like that, but they're witches. So maybe they don't continue through. But anyway, I digress. <laughs> <laughs> I actually did forget about that. <laughs> I know it's really strange. Um, okay, so let's see. So uh, uh, Neil, let's keep on moving. What could be? What could be your 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 final pick? What's one of your favorite antagonists other than Ganon? So, I think to go full circle here from my original choice, uh, I think Varen from Oracle of Ages is probably like the best non-Ganon antagonist. Um, she has a very, very, very active role in the story that isn't just like, ah, oh, I'm evil, world domination. No, <laughs> come none find of that. me. <laughs> right. Yeah. Like, to lay it out, she possesses Impa, tricks Link into removing a barrier to take her to see the Oracle of Ages, Nehru. She possesses Nehru, uses her power of time to go back to the past to influence the queen of Labrina and she's getting the queen to construct her tall black tower to loom over the land and have her sovereignty and all this stuff. And it's just feeding the ruler of land of the land, all this nonsense. And then eventually you go to confront her, you take her out. Awesome. Great. She then ends up possessing the queen And you have to flee back to the present. Uh, So now she is the ruler. She drops the bomb on you uh, that Ralph, who is Nehru's uh, bodyguard, more or less, that he is a direct descendant of the queen. And if they kill the queen that Nehru's or sorry, that uh, Varen's possessing, Ralph will cease to exist. You now have a moral dilemma as she just caused all these uh, anomalies throughout time, freezing people to stone or poisoning the Zoras, an entire race of people. You know, that's Ganon-level stuff. That's what he did. So to have someone we've never heard of before do all this, I think is astounding. But there's no real agenda of her own or anything because at the end of the day, this was uh, for her to light the, I I think it was the Flame of Sorrow was the specific uh, flame in the Room of Rights for Twin Rova's process to bring back Ganon. Mm -hmm. And that's everything she was leading towards uh because you know i think the only other big villain i can look at is like vadi because he has the most presence or anything and right his thing was just like i'm unhappy and i want to i want to be boss like that's it like <laughs> i agree this I has agree. levels for me <laughs> you you sold me on this 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 very thing i i remember I got or I got ages before seasons because I was very excited about the time travel mechanic and mm-hmm. I just thought, okay, this is gonna be a lot of fun. We're gonna have cause and effect stuff. Um, but I totally forgot that so much manipulation was happening with that antagonist. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because like you look at the sister game seasons and 
it's just General Onox sinks the Temple of Seasons down below the ground, and then you don't see him until you fight him at the very end of the game. You don't mm-hmm. hear from him. He's not a participant in the story. Nothing. Yeah, it was a very rushed last boss. Well, you know what? I just thought, yeah, you're right. You're absolutely right. And I just thought about something. The, perhaps you, you gentlemen are familiar that the, the two Oracle games, well, it started as Capcom asking Nintendo if they could simply remake The Legend of Zelda, the first mm-hmm. one for Game Boy. And so they started making assets and stuff like that. And um, I think basically, I'm paraphrasing here, but Nintendo said, no, but do you want to make some of your own? And then Capcom came back and said, we do. Can we make three of them? Mm -hmm. We want to make one for all three, a red, green, and a blue. And so they started building that based off of already having a little bit of a light build, perhaps tech demo-esque, a light build of the original Legend of Zelda. And so Oracle of Seasons has many of the assets, and that original build is in Oracle of Seasons, which is why that first dungeon feels just like the dungeon from the original Legend of Zelda. Mm -hmm. It's the same dragon, weird dragon unicorn thing. Aquamentus, yes. Yes, indeed, indeed. And so I'm surmising here that perhaps all of the interesting... Once they decided they were going to do three, and they started building out their stories, I guess what I'm trying to say, and I'm just deducing this right now, is Seasons there isn't as much motivation because there wasn't as much of an opportunity for that narrative to be there because they kind of had half a game and it's really just find the bad guy at the and end. that would make sense that like he's an afterthought at that point. Yeah, yeah. With ages, they got to really write something. And then, of, of, you know, real mm-hmm. quick note, the three games became two quickly because they realized it was going to become a lot of work. Right. And this was also around the time when there was the red and blue Pokemon and a lot of the trading mm-hmm. back and forth. And Nintendo said, that's cool, it's cool. Give us a red, give us a blue. Again, I'm paraphrasing all of this. I, I have no authentic research on what exactly no, Nintendo you're said. you're pretty much on it. But I think that was basically the general sentiment. Mm-hmm. So I would surmise that the Age's narrative is significantly more fleshed out. Yeah, that makes sense. I never thought about why that could be. Yeah, that makes complete sense. It's like the, it was like their game. It was Capcom making their game. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? And I think they did a great job with it. Yeah, then Especially like then. to basically use the Link's Awakening engine and make all this sprite work for elements from Ocarina and therefore Majora, like to have like those fairies and actual characters like Ingo show up in Seasons. Uh, I just thought yes. it was great. I, I was a huge fan of that. I concur. I concur. Okay, I guess I'm going to I'll have my I don't want to call my I don't want to say it's my top, but I'll call it my final. Um, and again, I was using kind of my my choices were limited because I was using this kind of main antagonist uh, thought process. So you know, you've got eight of them. <laughs> <laughs> you, know, you know, if you're just thinking about the big bads at the end, in many ways, I mean, there might be a few more here and there if you get technical. But um, we were talking about Girahim before the break, and we we were making fun of Zant a little bit. But I'm gonna talk. I'd like to talk about Zant. I'd like Zant to be. I yeah, guess absolutely. I guess my final. And if it comes to main antagonists, though you really sold me on ages, um, I do, the reason I chose for Zant to be the top of my list was pre-Zant battle, but like the essence of Zant when he first shows up in the beginning and the essence of Zant through those first five to eight dungeons or whatever it is in Twilight Princess, he's terrifying. Oh, yeah. You know, Scary. he's like, yeah. It was. It, I remember it being one of the first times, even not uh, even not being that scared in Majora's Mask, even though Majora's Mask is scary, mm-hmm. you know, esque or ish or whatever. I remember like seeing that Zant character walk in and that opening cutscene, and every time he'd show up, you know, my heart rate would raise. Uh, the first time I played through Twilight Princess, um, oh yeah, you know, it 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 does diminish a little bit when you realize that he's the Ganon puppet, and because mm-hmm. we got to bring Ganondorf back. I'm okay with it. I also think Ganondorf is phenomenal in Twilight Princess. I love that final battle with him. I don't want to take anything away from that. Mm-hmm. And I did rewatch the Zant battle to refresh my memory a little bit. Boy, he gets goofy. He yeah. just like loses his mind. He's he's. Yeah. I think he's almost he's more um, animated than Girahim by far. I mean, I think mm-hmm. he's. I would like to think maybe I'm making excuses here that Zant was. You know, I just thought of something. When he first meets Ganondorf in the cut in this cut scene, he's not a, a super cool dude. In fact, he's kind of a wimp running away from stuff. Mm-hmm. 
And then Ganondorf comes and basically sees like a weak person that needs power, that wants power, and says, I can help you. Mm-hmm. And then Zant finds his cool. That's when Zant becomes the scary cool Zant, the one that I kind of remember. It's easy to forget about the uh, coward Zant and then the crazy Zant at the end. Yeah. Um, but the but last thing I do want to say to it, and then I'll open it up f- f- for you two guys to make your comments about Zant, is uh, even though... I think his um, intimidation or presence is diminished a bit when I, I get it. They were trying to make him really weird. He does all these weird animations and stuff like that. And I think it's supposed to be off putting maybe the way Girahim is in my opinion, mm-hmm. successfully off putting for me, Zant, it, it was a little too much, but I can't take away the fact that that final b- battle with him is pretty good. It is pretty epic. It's the one where he transports uh, Link through many of the other boss battle arenas, but then reinterprets them in his own way by still using some of them. And, um, you know, you go back to, you're in the, you're in the forest, he's shooting stuff. Okay, fine. And then you're, then you're uh, in the Goron mines and he's, he's purposely rocking the thing and you got to put your boots on. It's a, it's a battle that forces you to go through the inventory you've collected so far and use it and use it in an organic way. Um, there's a cool part where um, over in, in the water dungeon, water temple, he has these weird masks that are coming up and he's coming out of the masks and you got to use your hook shot and all that kind of stuff. And then at the end of the day, there is a final mano imano kind of, you know, swords against swords battle, um, which is fine too. Do you uh, guys have any specific memories about Zant? Yes. I think Ooh. I, I honestly, Zant was... It's probably one of my favorite non-Ganon villains, and I think that he could have probably he could have definitely stood on his own throughout the game, even without the Ganon. You know, not discrediting the Ganondorf twist in that game, I right. still think that if they hadn't done that, it would be good. Like when Zant shows up on the scene, having you know turned his own people into monsters to like sack Hyrule Castle, and he just like kind of just walks in there in these shadows come over him and like those knights just all get wiped out yes and then like xant also is like unlike ganondorf in in most games where you, you know ganondorf you know he's there you know you have to stop him because he's gonna do things and his his evil is shown in the form of like the bosses the boss battles like and and like but he's not directly like involved in the plot for most of the game xant shows up and like really messes up your plans like Zant shows up and uses a light spirit against you yeah mm-hmm. and, and he just like appears out of nowhere like Zant it, like there are parts of that game where I was just like man Zant is kind of like all powerful yeah he was a I real agree. active threat yeah in fact I guess that's what I, I'm ac- I'm accidentally speaking to is that I feel like they had to kind of um bring him down a notch or two so that Ganondorf could then become the big threat. But mm-hmm. I think I love that Ganondorf, I love that the Ocarina Ganondorf is in Twilight Princess. You know, the, the nerd in me loves that, but I agree. I feel like Zant could, uh, they, they, if they wouldn't have brought him down and if they would have brought him up a notch, so to speak, mm-hmm. he would have been a, a, a completely satisfactory, um, antagonist for the entire game. Cause like as much as I love fighting Ganondorf in that game, on the entire story level, he didn't really bring much to it. And if he wasn't there and they just amped up Sant further, he would have been perfect. But yeah. at the same time, I understand the importance of just kind of showing us like, oh, for uh, for lack of a, of a better phrase, he's just an angry kid. And yeah. Ganon gave him a baseball bat. That's what happened. Like a really cool baseball bat where he was able to make his entrance and have it and do all these crazy things. Mm-hmm. I feel like it's narratively, it's unfortunate. It does feel like maybe it was a choice that was made halfway through development or something like that. So I don't want to take too much away from Xanth. The final, right. the, that final battles, I, I don't want to say unfortunate because mechanically it's interesting. But well, it works because somebody finally challenged his power that he believed was unstoppable and that he believed was his. I mean, that's a good point. You're right. Yeah, that's why he's like a little unhinged and like mm-hmm. more animated. And, I, and it does add it. I don't know. It it adds to. Uh, I think it does add to his overall overall character. Like it I, works. It definitely works. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I think okay. I also. I'm hearing always, you. I always felt like the you know because he was so calm and powerful throughout the game, like they really had to to go into the um, 
they really had to have that cutscene with Ganondorf on uh, an Arbiter's Ground with mm-hmm. them sealing him away and him killing a sage mm. just to kind of reset, like, this is the guy that's actually really strong. And, like, we're going to show you why. Because That's where now, I'm at in Twilight Princess currently. And, man, that scene, just, even today, was powerful. Just, yeah. I think that is the best scene of the entire game. Because it's just like, you know, he breaks free from the chain kills a sage like you Mm -hmm. have to they had to do that to just like to level set like okay zant might have he may have done all these things to you up until this point but like this Mm -hmm. is the guy that's really pulling the strings and like now we have to demonstrate his power exactly because before that i was like this man's crazy he like you know he walked in the front door of uh Hyrule Castle. Like, and he the owned place. the place. Yeah. Where, My where, goodness. You know, whereas Ganondorf had to pretend to be friends. So I'm like, true. that's, you know, that was the, you know, the more it's like. It's a power move. Yeah. It's a power move, <laughs> isn't yeah. it? Um, I think w- let's just for the fun of it, imagine a scenario where, and I don't think, I don't, I don't think Twilight Princess needs to be changed at all. I'm not trying to say, you know, I'm not trying to be a critic, but what if there would have been a situation where instead of Ganondorf controlling Zant, you know, somehow they, oh, I don't know. I don't want to start writing new narrative here or anything. But, you know, I was thinking, like, essentially, what if they battled? and What if they were actually also antagonists to each other? And then, you know, I don't know. I don't know. Maybe I'm going bar- barking up a strange tree here. But do you see what I'm trying to touch on? Yeah, like, they were, like, Zant. I mean, I kind of I kind of almost feel like, in a way, you could say that it was. Just because I felt like Zant... Although he, you know, he's getting this power from Ganondorf, like it's almost like he he does view it as it it's his own power and like this is like you know rightfully his and I think he kind of carries himself that way throughout the game until you really start to beat him. That's yeah. when he gets when he gets unhinged, and I think that's where Ganondorf also decides to make you know like reveal himself. Yeah, I agree. I agree. So yeah, maybe that is the appropriate trans- transition after all. So, um, Lawrence, last but not least here, what what do you have uh, for your list? Uh, see, this is not nearly as good as uh, Zant, um, but I'm going to go with Back to Ocarina of Time, yep. and I'm going to say Bongo Bongo, the Shadow <laughs> Temple boss. Yep, oh, yep. Man. That was another one of Kate's favorites. Because this was like, you know, the boss battle in itself is interesting and the entire temple in itself is interesting. And then some of like the speculation and like headcanon lore behind Bongo Bongo uh, is uh, is is interesting to me because like there is, um, you know, like the 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 fan theories that Bongo Bongo is a um, kind of like rogue a uh, Sheikah member that just like betrayed the the group and then they were tortured and then ultimately killed inside of the Shadow Temple and their spirit remained and it formed into this monster and um it's like you you see that when you're going through the Shadow Temple there is a like torture chamber part where you can see like there's that that uh whatever you call it, where someone was strapped to it and there was like kind of a pool of blood around it at the bottom. Yeah, yeah, I know. And then you see that like Bongo Bongo has these like, you know, his hands are severed from like his arms. So it kind of still, it fits that of like, you know, they probably like tortured this traitor and like, you know, probably like just cut him up and now you're seeing the monster that's taking the form of that. So (laughs) it was like the darkest part of the game to, in my opinion, I think like the, the there's a lot of uh, if you really kind of like go like stretch it, go for a stretch. It's like there's a lot of symbolism about like knowing uh, knowing the truth about like like even like I guess like just like learning the truth. Like you have the lens of truth, and I think it's supposed to like represent that like. Bongo Bongo saw the truth about like either the Sheikah tribe or the Hyrule royal family. And, you know, he made his own took his made his own path and ultimately was killed because of it. So there's like I feel like it's the temple and the boss and the game that has like you can interpret it however way you want. 
I think and, there's a lot of inference there. It's funny because when people first ex- are exposed, sometimes they think like, why is this, why is this go- goofy drummer boss in the, in the shadow temple or the spirit temple or, you know, and, uh, I think when you, maybe, maybe it's a touch goofy, but I, I don't know. I think when you put it all together like this, it's haunting. Yeah. It just, it feels like, like bottom of the well, shadow temple, everything leading to Bongo Bongo feels like the first real point of like natural environmental storytelling in the game. Because yeah. up until that point, it's just like, oh man, we got to save the Deku tree and the Gorons and the Zoras. Okay, let's do that again. And then. Boom, Shadow Temple. Mm-hmm. You're not really there to save anyone. There's just something weird going on with the well. <laughs> like yeah. you gotta investigate. <laughs> um that yeah, because also once you defeat Bongo Bongo, if I'm not mistaken, unlike the other sages, it's not like Impa is awakened or anything. She has been that sage, and you just honest to God stopped a real threat that's something ugly part of Hyrule's history that yeah. nobody knew until now. Right. I'm for, I right, I agree. I'm forgetting. Did Impa go down into the well before you? Yes. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I believe so. Cuz then and then we are to deduce that she perishes down there cuz it seems like all the sages perish before they become a sage. And most of the time they they perish in the dungeon just just ahead of you, quite frankly. <laughs> yeah. And so it it's like yeah, like it is this just like older kind of threat and you know, it's, you can infer like, well, what caused this? Like, you know, what caused this person to, you know, betray, you know, possibly betray the Sheikah tribe and like, how was Hyrule back then? And I, and I think there's just like a lot of mystery and I, and I think it, it uh, kind of crops back up and it was, it's become a little bit more interesting to me with breath of the wild mm-hmm. and having the, uh, Yiga clan, yeah. And showing that yeah. there is actually like a divide between or divide inside of this group and it's splintered into like two opposing forces now. Yeah, I agree completely. And, you know, maybe maybe uh, it would be exciting to think about the idea that the seeds of what the Yiga clan became were from Bongo Bongo or something like that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Very, is, is there any upside down Sheikah symbols in 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 the the? In Ocarina? I don't think they were doing that yet, right? Is his eye... I'm trying to remember. Think so. Does his you know eye, what I mean? Does it go up instead of down? Does the eye of Bongo Bongo do that? Because it's like his, like... Technically, he's got an eye, but it's like... It looks like it's a decapitated head, but I think it just oh. might be a circular pattern. Yeah, I think you're right. Yeah. I think you're right. Anyways, anyways, cool. Well, okay, so we have we have quite a few entries here. This is very exciting. Um... I wanted to, we have a couple of people that tweeted us with what could be our 10th, 10th item here, so to speak, a 10th item, 10th entry. Um, so I, I shot out a tweet the other day real quick saying that I was excited to have you gentlemen on the show and uh, asked some people what they might want to use, what their th- picks were for other antagonists. And right off the bat here, uh, Alex underscore in a box tweeted, Vadi, Onyx, Varen, and Twinrova. Awesome. Covered all of those. <laughs> uh, Dave Wayne 09 said, uh, Vadi is one who needs a return to the series, but Dark Link deserves it more. Uh, full disclosure, I have not read these yet. Uh, that's interesting. Um, Kirsty Beth, K A E R S T E B E T H. Kirsty Beth said, uh, Girahim and his epic background music. Marie underscore Deventer. Said Zant. Okay, wow, we got a lot of stuff going on here. Uh, J Jcast sixty five oh two tweeted us and said, "Kind of creepy." Oh, <laughs> this doesn't happen. He tweeted us. So I have a, I run an IFTTT that just grabs anytime we get at replied and throws it into a spreadsheet. That's how I can keep these. Um, like that's how I can do it so I don't see them before. Mm-hmm. It's like I'm not copying and pasting them. Anyway, so this one snuck in, but this is great. This is great. Jcast six five oh two tweeted us and said, "Another Zelda pod." Kind of creepy when the podcast is literally talking to me. Winky face. He, of course, was. In, we just did a listener feedback episode, and he was one of the feedbacks that we read. No problem, Jcast. Well, now you're getting creeped out twice over. Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, Preston Lambert then said, "Hey, hey, easy way, 
Oh, I'm sorry. This one also is not about bosses, but I'll read it real quick. Hey, hey, easy way to remember Talon and Malin at Lon Lon Ranch. Their name's Talon and Malin. Uh, love the podcast. You guys are great. Because we were we were getting confused between Talon, Malin, and Marin and Taryn, of course. Oh, okay. Yeah, they're quite similar in identity, but Malin, Talon, and Lon Lon Ranch. I like that. <laughs> Fair enough. Well, do you know what? I don't think there are any new ones there, guys. No, I mean, well, to be I mean, fair, I guess we could throw... antagonists are a little, uh, little thin <laughs> throughout the course of the series. It's true. We, uh, I think the closest we get is Onyx, which basically got an honorable mention by you a couple times, Neil, yes. but wasn't an official entry. You know, I think this no. means that, that the number one villain has to be <laughs> Ganondorf. <laughs> <laughs> I think you're right. I think you're right. Oh, man. Okay. Well, let's see. That is great. If anybody uh, has any thoughts about some any other antagonists that we maybe didn't mention or, or have some comments about what we said, you can always tweet us at Another Zelda Pod. You can find us on YouTube and Facebook by just by searching Another Zelda Podcast. I am on Twitter personally and Instagram as at Raptor Paint. And uh, Neil and Lawrence, I'm going to invite you guys to uh, share the things you'd like to share. Neil, why don't you go first? Oh my goodness, share anything I have to share. Oh, that's a lot of uh, power in that. Uh, well, how about this? I'll jump over. Li- yeah. No, Sorry, no, it's okay. I was going to give you a second. I was going to give you a second, jump over to Lawrence so he can at least give us some of the, the lore party shares. Oh, yeah. Um, you can find us on uh, Twitter and Instagram at lore underscore party. You can find us on Facebook too by searching lore party and on YouTube as well. Uh, same thing. Um, Fantastic. Do you have a personal Instagram or a personal Twitter, Lawrence, that you'd care to share? If not, that's totally fine. Uh, yeah, I do. I mean, I, I do a lot of music work um, as oh. well, too. So my personal Twitter handle is just, it's produced by underscore LK. Um, Interesting. So I do. Uh, do you make music for any of the podcasts that you guys do? Yeah, I made the uh, the theme music for Minigame, Winds Howling, and... Uh, and like a lot of our like just kind of in feed ads that we do, I love it. That's wonderful. Very very cool. That that Twitter account one more time was. We have a lot of music fans on this show. Oh, uh, my Twitter account is um, uh, produced by underscore lk. Cool. All right, Neil. I'm swinging back around to you. You've all had right. a second. I've got nothing to plug <laughs> at all. No personal <laughs> projects. So uh, I'll use okay. this time to stay say uh, stay home, stay safe, and wash your hands. Indeed, wonderful, wonderful. Well, gentlemen, I'm very excited. In a couple of days, we're going to meet back up, and it'll be it'll be you two in the steering wheel, and I'll be the guest on your show. I can't wait. I can't wait to uh, invite all the listeners from Zelda, another Zelda podcast to go check out Lore Party and all of the other shows that you guys are doing. And thank you so much for hanging out with me tonight and, and building this list. Oh, Thanks yeah. for having us. This yeah, is was, great. This yeah, is this fun. Was awesome. Marvelous. So we do do a thing. I don't know if you gentlemen are familiar yet. Um, my normal co-host, Kate, she is she's out for the season right now, to be honest. And uh, she all, she started doing this thing in season one where she would say, OK, bye at the end. <laughs> so it's a rule now. The guests have to say, OK, bye when we're done. <laughs> so Neil, Lawrence, it's been a pleasure. Thank you so much. Again, I can't wait to see you on Laura, Laura Party. Uh, until until perhaps there'll be another episode in the AZP future and until then I'll see you all right okay, okay bye. bye there it is that works <laughs> that works for me thank you thank you guys thank you thank you